Has my background changed? The presentation is there. Can you have virtual background? It's not that important. Are we live? Yes. Like, have we let the guests in already? Or? Yes, we make the same. Okay. Can we start? Yes, you let me. Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Sona Comstar's Q3 and 9M FY22 earnings conference call. Please note all participant lines are in the listen only mode as of now. There will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Please note that this call is being recorded. We request that you place your lines on mute except when asking a question. Some of the statements by the management team in today's conference call may be forward looking in nature and we request you to refer to the disclaimer in the earnings presentation for further details. The management will also not be taking any specific customer related questions or confirm or deny any customer names or relationships due to confidentiality reasons. Please refrain from naming any customer in your questions. Now I'll hand over the floor to Mr. Kapil Singh Head of Consumer and Digital Commerce Research India and Lead Autos Analyst at Namura. Kapil, please go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, to take us through Q3 and nine month FY22 results and to answer your questions, uh, we are pleased to welcome Mr. Vivek Vikram Singh, MDN Group CEO, Mr. Kiran Manohar Deshmukh, Group CTO, Mr. Vikram Verma, CEO of the Tribeline Business, Mr. Sat Mohan Gupta, CEO of the Motor Business. Mr. Rohit Nanda, Group CFO, and Mr. Amit Mishra, Head Investor Relations. I will now hand over the call to Vivek for his opening remarks and the presentation, which will be followed by a Q&A. Uh, thank you, Kapil, and good day, everyone. On behalf of Sona Comstar, I'd like to welcome all of you to our earnings call. So we'll begin with the not-so-good news. After many quarters of strong growth in financial results, uh, the effects of the semiconductor chip shortage have caught up with us in this quarter. And uh, we've had a quarter with flat revenue growth and a decline in EBITDA. And although there is a 4% growth in reported net profit, it includes a one-time tax benefit. Now, despite the low sales and headwinds on material prices, freight costs, and all other input costs. We managed to maintain our best-in-class margins at the same level as last quarter, and I'm quite proud of our team, which has done a stellar job of managing costs and proving that while they're good in good times, they are quite exceptional in tough times. And the one note of optimism that I would like to add here would be that in our opinion, December 2021 was the lowest point of the chip crisis. And from here on, we should start seeing gradual improvement every quarter, although full resolution remains a few quarters away. Uh, the massive silver lining in this environment uh, was our battery electric vehicle revenue growth, where we more than doubled our revenue. And this also shows how much the conventional business has fallen this quarter. To demonstrate that point further, if we were to look at the data of US and Europe, our two largest markets, sales are down 22% year on year. In fact, the last quarter was the second worst quarter of auto sales in US and Europe after the global financial crisis of 2008. So, yes, we've had a flat performance. However, we hope that it is seen in the context of our industry and its situation. And 
Another data point worth noting here is that even for the nine month period of this fiscal, uh, these markets are down by 1%. While in quite stark contrast to that, uh, we managed to achieve 54% growth in revenue, 65% uh, growth in net profit in the same nine month period. And this has happened due to our consistent business development efforts with our customers and improving our share of wallet and global market shares, which have reached 6.3% for differential gears and 4.6% for starter motors at the end of calendar year uh, 2021, which is a solid improvement over our position at the end of calendar year 2020. Now for the well, better news, uh, the update on our strategic priorities, beginning with EV. So our BEV revenue share has increased to 23% on the nine month period. Uh, it was 14% in FY21. In absolute terms, it has grown by 168% to reach over 355 crore in the first nine months of this fiscal. And it gives me great joy to report that we've added four new EV programs from three new EV customers just in this quarter alone. And these are all large wins. Uh, the new wins are a differential assembly program from an existing customer for Europe, uh, an e-axle program for an Indian three-wheeler new customer, a motor and controller program from another new Indian three-wheeler customer, and a very unique and new product program for a new customer for the European market, which I'll elaborate upon a little later. With this, we reach 24 electric vehicle programs across 14 unique customers. Now, we've made this chart to help provide more transparency and clarity on the penetration of our electric vehicle programs. And as you can see, our EV story is quite global, quite deep, and with 17 programs not yet in serial production, quite indicative of strong future growth. And now let us share with you about the new order win for an entirely new product for us. And although this new product has nothing to do with propulsion, since the end vehicle is electrified, we've included it as an EV program. So what is happening is that with the advent of electrification and autonomous vehicles, there are many new interesting and challenging opportunities. One of them is around smarter suspension. So the product we are making is the integrated motor controller module or IMCM, which goes into something called a predictive active suspension system. Now we don't make the whole system. We just make the motor controller plus software module of it. Now let's give, let's see a short video that demonstrates this product because it's hard to explain in a short time what the product does. So Pratik, if you could just play the video. Right. So this is a futuristic suspension system which has our integrated motor controller module which senses every bump and speed breaker and then independently responds to all external disturbances. In simplistic terms, the motor generates an exact counteracting force to mitigate the impact of uneven road surfaces so that the vehicle glides over all kinds of roads. This capability extends further to anticipating oncoming potholes or road disturbances through the geospatial software and react with lightning speed. Now, whether the passenger is in the front seat or rear seat, the ride becomes much smoother with complete avoidance of motion sickness. In fact, it's several orders of magnitude smoother than a vehicle without a predictive active suspension. Now, of course, there are three reasons why this new order win is so important for us. Uh, first, this validates our faith in the power of innovation. This new product has only been successful due to our extensive R&D on belt starter generator or BSG especially the thermal management and the software modules. 
And this also proves our hypothesis that owning and controlling our primary technologies gives us the ability to keep iterating and innovating and finding multiple different applications and products for the same technology. Second point is that with almost 2 million lines of code per IMCM, it also validates our belief that the ability to integrate hardware and software will keep getting more importance as vehicles and the systems inside them get increasingly smarter and more autonomous. And thirdly, of course, uh, commercially this is quite significant as it adds a brand new revenue stream for us as a company. And with this first signal order alone, uh, this win alone adds up to 400 crore revenue per year. And it also means that our order book is shaping up in such a way that in financial year 26, we will be generating more revenue from traction motors and active suspension motors than we did from starter motors in FY21, which is a complete flip from what this business used to be three years ago. Which, of course, uh, brings me to our net order book. On the back of these four new EV wins and some new non-EV wins, at the end of Q3, we've reached 17.6 thousand crore or around $2.3 billion versus 13.6 thousand crore last quarter. Uh, the EV part of the order book has increased from 58.5% and 79 billion at the end of Q2 to 66.4% and 116 billion at the end of Q3. And uh, this ratio expected uh, to continue increasing. Another thing to point out here is that Although we continue to win uh, new orders in the electric two-wheeler and three-wheeler space in India, in value terms, almost 90% of our EV order book is still passenger cars and mostly from outside India. We want to mention this to illustrate uh, that while we are and will continue to be participating and benefiting from the India EV story. We have a much, much larger growth driver in the shape of electrified passenger cars in the global markets. Uh, now coming to diversification, we begin as always with the revenue cut by power trade. Uh, here increasing BEV share from 1% in FY19 to 23% in uh, the first nine months. Uh, underlines the dominant and secular trend and the reciprocal trend also that our exposure to ICE has been reducing in every period to reach now 19%. Moving to geography, uh, this quarter had fairly disrupted schedules, so has changed the percentages a little bit, but overall the mix remains balanced across uh, all our four major markets, which are North America, Europe, India, and Asia. As I said last time, this mix will keep changing from quarter to quarter, depending on the performances of these uh, four markets, and more critically, our customers' performances in these end markets. We are fairly well diversified to mitigate issues at any one specific end market. However, the dynamic around the virus and the supply chain shortages which affect everyone will affect us like any other player in the industry. On products, our revenue share from differential assemblies has grown from 5.6% in FY20 to 26%, uh, which is fairly dramatic uh, increase. In the coming years, we will also add the IMCM product that we just showed to this chart and uh, Hopefully, keep continuing our journey from a components play to a subsystems and systems play. Finally, coming to vehicle segments where there are three inferences. CV demand, especially in India, is starting to gradually pick up, gradually being the operative word. Off-highway segment has weakened. And thirdly, our efforts on the traction motors and controllers in the electric two-wheeler, three-wheeler space have finally started showing some results and uh, they have reached a full percentage point for the nine month period. Uh, with that, I'll turn the call over to our group's CTO, Mr. Deshpo, to discuss our approach to technology. 
Over to you, sir. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yet another revolution in personal transportation accompanying the electrification uh, is triggered by uh, connected, automated, and autonomous uh, vehicle technologies. Uh, while electrification has been fostered by the concerns about global warming and regulations, Automation of mobility is driven by the technology's societal benefits relating to safety, uh, convenience, reliability, and equity. Automation technology that performs at least some aspects of a safety critical control function without direct driver input is not binary, but there is a spectrum of levels of automation. So the Society of Automotive Engineers International, SAE, uh, categorizes automated driving functionality into distinct levels, summarized by the level of driver involvement uh, during operation, as uh, depicted in this slide. Uh, we all know, I mean, it is well-known cruise control, uh, lane positioning uh, have uh, become uh, standard features in many uh, uh, standard, many mainstream automobiles. Uh, the advent of uh, sensor technology, uh, connectivity, high-speed uh, computing, high-definition mapping, complementary infrastructure development, and regulatory frameworks will transition uh, automation to higher levels in the not-too-distant future. So as automation moves to higher levels, uh, many systems and subsystems in the vehicle will get smarter, and closely, uh, they will need computing intelligence in situ, uh, memory, uh, integrated sensing and actuation functions. This presents many opportunities for suppliers like us who can and will integrate uh, hardware and software uh, to develop the new generation of uh, systems. So, our Technology roadmap, which is now expanded, as you can see, uh, compared to previous uh, call, uh, addresses both the revolutions uh, taking place in mobility. So it displays our vision of becoming a significant player in electric vehicles and autonomous and connected vehicles. Uh, the product roadmap uh, is intended to show uh, our past, present, and future uh, products. Uh, so the dark area here shows our legacy or core products, uh, differential gears and starter motors. The blue area shows the products that we have developed in recent years and which we are offering to the customers, which our current products. Uh, and the products shown in the white area are currently under development in our R&D centers, our aspiration for the future. So our competence in hardware and software engineering, uh, integration, and thermal management have allowed us uh, to expand our product range into the growing autonomous and connected space, as exemplified by the recently introduced integrated motor control module that uh, we just now showed which offers comfort and convenience to the occupants of the car. So with that, I will hand it over to Rohit to uh, cover the financial update. Thank you, Mr. Deshmukh. Uh, a very good day to you all. It's my pleasure to share our third quarter and nine months results with you. Merger of Sona BLW and Comstar India has become effective on 28th January 2022 with 5th July 2019 as the appointed date. The reported standalone financials, therefore, are reflecting the merged accounts of the two entities for the first time, and comparable periods have been restated accordingly. The merger, however, doesn't have any impact on the consolidated financials reported and being presented here. I will start with the YOY comparison for our third quarter results. Our overall revenue grew by 1% to 4.94 billion rupees. Our DEV revenue, however, grew at a robust pace of 108% to 135 crore rupees. Our non-DEV revenue 
is however lower by 15% mainly due to a decline in the industry sales by 22% in our key markets of US and Europe. Our EBITDA margin at 26.4% is within our historical range. Better product mix had a 2% positive impact on the margin, whereas adverse impact of 5.5% came from increase in the material prices. Out of this 5.5%, 4.2% impact is despite the material price pass through to the customers because of the arithmetic effect of revenue and cost going up by the same value. Balance 1.3% impact is due to the material price increase wherein price pass through was not available to us. Our reported PAT of 864 million rupees is higher by 4% on a year on year basis. Higher depreciation, lower interest and other income put together had an adverse impact of 0.4% on our PAT. In the third quarter, however, we have a one time tax impact which has increased our reported PAT. Adjusted for this one time impact, our PAT would be 738 million rupees and PAT margin would be at 14.9%. Earlier in our presentation, Vivek had shown you the graph of Europe plus US sales over the last 13 years or so. As you would have noticed, one of the key takeaways from there is the seasonality effect on the sales from quarter to quarter within the year. In view of this, we feel quarter on quarter comparison may not be providing any useful insights and therefore we have decided to discontinue with it from this quarter in our presentation. So I will straight away jump to the nine month comparison now on a YOY basis. Our nine month revenue grew to 15.81 billion rupees, which is higher than the last full year revenue. Our DEV revenue grew by 167% and non-DEV revenue grew by 37%. And this is despite a 1% decline in the industry sales in our key markets of US and Europe over the same time. Our EBITDA grew by 41% to 4.24 billion rupees with a margin at 26.8%. Positive levers for the margin were the product mix at 3.2% and operating leverage at 1.6%. However, there was an adverse impact of 5.7% due to increase in the material prices, out of which 4.3% is despite the material price increase passed through to the customer and balance 1.4% is due to price pass through not being available to us. Besides this, we also had a higher forex gain in the comparable period last year, which had an adverse impact of 1.6% on the margin. Our PAT has grown by 65% to 2569 million rupees, which is also higher than the last full year PAT. Depreciation, interest cost and other income had a positive impact of 1.3% on the PAT margin. One-time tax impact and reversal of IPO expenses had a further positive impact of another 1.4%. Finally, we move on to the key ratios. Now here we have made some small changes from the last time to ensure a more consistent reporting. For return and turnover ratios, in case of P&L items, we have now shifted to last 12 month numbers instead of the annualized numbers which we were using earlier. And for balance sheet items, we have moved to average of opening and closing numbers instead of using only closing numbers, which were, which would uh, vitiate uh, the ratios calculated because it was at a given point of time. Now, value addition to employee cost in our case has improved to 5.6 times compared to the earlier two years. And this needs to be appreciated in the inflationary background that we are in, wherein the material costs are going up. Our return on capital employed and return on equity ratios at around 36% demonstrate a continued robust return profile. Our net debt to EBITDA ratio has turned negative as uh, we have paid off the long-term debt from equity proceeds uh, raised earlier in the year. And CAPEX for the year so far has been funded largely through the internal accruals. Lastly, on to the turnover ratio, the company continues to demonstrate efficient management of its working capital and fixed assets as both the turnover ratios have further improved from the earlier two years despite the market headwinds. With this, we come to the conclusion of our uh, quarterly earnings presentation and I'll now hand the proceedings back to the Namura team. Hi, uh, Juliet. Can we start the Q&A, please?
Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you can um, either type in the question on oh. the Q and A box. Thank you. Yeah. Or. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Yeah. We will sure. now open the floor for the Q and A session. If you wish to raise a question, please use the raise hand function located at the bottom right of the WebEx page. We will unmute your line and prompt you to speak. Or you may submit your questions via Q&A chat box addressing to all panelists. Please be reminded to keep your questions to a maximum of two questions. If you have more questions, please return to queue. Thank you. The first question is from Deepak Yadav. Uh, your line is unmuted, Deepak. Can you please go ahead? Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Deepak. So, um, hi, sir. Uh, so, uh, my question is from uh, Mr. Vikram. Um, so, I saw your interview with Bloomberg where you rightly mentioned that after a while, being in EV auto ancillary will not be enough. Uh, this could be rather communal. So, how you look into the future with respect of with respect to innovation? Like, do you want to really go into connected vehicle space, autonomous vehicle space, or supplying automotive software, etc.? And would you think of acquisitions for the same? Second question is: um, I believe two-wheeler EV adoption will be faster than four-wheeler. So, how you are planning this opportunity? What are your plans here? Thank you. So thank you, Deepak. Uh, good question, and thank you for watching me. Uh, so two parts. Uh, the second one, I think we can address first. Pratik, uh, we do have in our appendix a slide which shows our strategy on electrification. Uh, so Pratik, if you could just go to yes. Now, Deepak, to your question, if you look at our slide, we have always. Uh, and position ourselves that in India, it is the two-wheeler, three-wheeler market that is going to be electrified first, perhaps followed by the bus segment, but we want to play in the two-wheeler, three-wheeler space, and uh, that's where our first generation of uh, PMSM, BLDC motors, etc. are there, and we're trying to make use of this opportunity. However, I try to also mention that even in the motor business, because our technology, now the same technology can be applied to different use cases if you actually own that technology and can find different applications. So when we were doing the research on BSC, which is more of a torque assist to provide for a hybrid vehicle, the same research got us to that point that we could come to that, uh, you know, the active suspension motor. That is exactly what our roadmap tries to depict when we say that we are going into autonomous and connected. And I think there is this perception that an autonomous vehicle does not mean that it is a robo taxi with uh, driving itself with no human. It is a journey. It is a journey that may take 15 years to get there, may take 20, may take 10. But the thing is, while it happens, all the components and systems will continue to get smarter. And by smarter, I mean it will have intelligence, which is decision-making ability, which will be done heuristically, and hence an algorithm would be required, and it will require memory. So the question is not that whether will, will we get into software. We are in software. Like this, uh, you know, the IMCM that we are making has 2 million lines of code. I don't think there is a choice. I don't think any hardware player worth their salt in the next 10 years can avoid having software. And how many lines of code per gram of metal will become important? I mean, the modern car today has about 100 million lines of code in it. 
so it is already happening and we have to move in that direction we have added that dimension to our roadmap and we will continue to progress on it i think we last time uh, we spoke we had about 20 29 software engineers uh, we are expanding that and it will cross 50 by the end of this year acquisitions is a is was also in your first question so yes definitely wherever we think there are capability gaps we would acquire we are not very uh, jv focused usually we are like i said we like to own and control our technology so that we can iterate so that we can keep experimenting we'll not get it right all the time but keep experimenting and then we will get to another use of something that already existed so the r&d uh money that went towards you know the development of the bsc we haven't sold a bsc yet we don't have a commercial order for a bsc yet but we managed to from that same research add an entirely new revenue item into our tnn which is uh, which only happens if you truly understand and own your technology and i think that is the kind of company that we will continue to be uh you know product roadmaps evolve as you've seen in the last 9 months we've changed the product roadmap this time around strategies evolve acquisition all of these things evolve but your core identity who you are as a company that doesn't change that in yours that is our value we are an engineering company which focuses on r&d and innovation i think that's something we will continue to be i hope that answered your question dipak exactly and thanks for this uh, explanation this answers my question thank you the next question is from uh, nitin arora nitin your line is unmuted please go ahead hi sir good evening uh, and good evening to the team uh, so my uh, first question on this uh, very interesting new product which you say showcase today uh, and so i just wanted to understand that how one should look the potential of this product in other oems you said you know you you have made this uh, for one particular oem uh, you know if you can throw some light you know how fast this can eventually become more potential with the other oems and uh, you know does that really add on a big cost uh, to the vehicle uh, or it's more of a very game changer product you know which could eventually get adopted so that's my first question Just a little very uh, well, very wise question. But you are wise. Uh, it is an expensive system. It is not uh, an inexpensive solution, right? If you add, uh, I think this was a question when someone had asked us about hub wheel motors. If you add four motors to each wheel, it is a very expensive solution to what is being answered today mechanically. However, the like I said, the it is. the order of magnitude is just different like because the chassis virtually remains stable while the wheels go up and down because what you're doing is doing the counteracting force however like i said the cost is quite high i mean there are four of these in one vehicle that itself is a big deal and i think each one uh, such how much it how many times more of a starter motor would be one of these motors it will be around 4 uh, to 5 times yeah 4 to 5 times so it is expensive uh, nitin so our guess this will be only for enf segment uh, vehicles for at least the next 5 6 5 to 10 years it will be limited to enf segment enf segment today i think would be around 3 million uh, annual volume so that's the total addressable universe uh, with enf segment as a proportion of the total passenger vehicle space expand that uh, that i don't know if that expands the opportunity expand however over time in a fact that we should know about automotive industry and technology in general right everything starts out being a very expensive and you know targeted towards the luxury or upper middle class segment however it does come down over time when acs were launched in cars in india for the first time it was seen as for 
the upper segment. Now over time it becomes something that is ubiquitous in an every way. But yeah, it will take, it will take time. For the next five to ten years, I think ENF segment is is where it is. After that, maybe it can go to the D segment. Got it. Uh, and so my second question uh, related to your view on the passenger vehicle, uh, especially the electric penetration in India. Uh, as you said, you know, the first direction you have, which was laid out uh, earlier as well. But any progress uh, for us in the DA part, in the motors part for the passenger vehicles, or your views in terms of penetration in India in, in the passenger side? Uh, and just one more part, uh, as you stated in, in the in the earlier uh, opening remarks, stating about the gradual improvement in chips. Uh, you think uh, when, when you say gradual, uh, one should assume a quarter by quarter rate increasing. Uh, that's that's what you were uh, about to say about gradual, or is it like that? You know, uh, let's look at beyond second half of FI23. That's where the right picture to look at it. Uh, those were the two questions. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Nitin, I'll answer the second one first. Till then, Pratik, uh, just take this to the world map of the EV programs for the first part. So, the second part, I mean, look, the chip shortage is a supply-demand mismatch, which was at its widest, I feel, in mid-November and end December. The gap has started narrowing. Will it go to zero, right? Will it go to zero is when no one has to, no automaker is forced to not sell a car or not make a car because there is a supply chain issue. I think that that demand supply is not going to zero percent. That's a, that's a few quarters away. That's a few quarters away. However, it will continue to narrow from here. For some people, it may, some OEMs, it may come much earlier. It may come, uh, mid 2022 some it will come end 2022 and some it will come mid 2023 that zero percent point okay. so it will keep improving though. and i think you will see also that a lot of people have found some uh, clever hacks uh, to reduce the number of uh, chips in the vehicle especially in the a and b segment so you will see those things also coming in people this is very rare, right, that you're sitting on an opportunity and you can't monetize. So everybody is out there trying to do their best. Uh, all I can say is the worst is behind us. Uh, it will keep improving. Full 0% supply-demand mismatch when we again all go back to talking about demand issues, that's, that's a while away. Second, in India, to answer your question, Nathan, if anything in electrification happens, at least on the driveline side, we will be a part of it. In motors, as you know, in passenger vehicle, we don't have a product yet for traction. So yeah. that we continue to work on. Uh, when we do have it, we will update you. But if there is a PV uh, opportunity or let's say number of electric vehicles uh, sold in India and in passenger vehicle, what is our market share in differential gears in India? That much we should be able to get in the electrified part of it also. But it's still small. The value-wise, that opportunity is still small. I'll come back in the queue, sir. Thank you so much, Pran. Thank you, Dr. The next question is from Gunjan Pritiani. Gunjan, your line is unmuted. You can go ahead, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, team, for taking my questions. I had two questions. Firstly, on the uh, BEV uh, differential assembly, just uh, trying to get a little bit more color on this. Can you share how many active customers, uh, you know, the ones in the serial production are there uh, in the BEV differential assembly right now? And also, if you could share what is the market share uh, you know, globally in the BEV uh, diff assembly. I saw the market share shared for diff gear and uh, uh, starter motor, but I'm not sure if you shared this number. Yeah, so I don't think we have it, uh, but from what I remember, 
Pratik, what was it? One, one in eight, twelve and a half percent to fourteen percent between that. Yes, yes. How much? Which one? Twelve and a half. So it was one out of eight uh, vehicles. Yeah, so only 12 and a half percent, but we don't actually actively track it. I'll tell you the reason: the denominator is changing far too quickly for us to know. In a more, see, total number of vehicles is easy, but then you have to break it down to total number of vehicles, how many electrified, and then there is a third order thing, which is how many differentials per uh, vehicle, which is the hard part because people don't give. Uh, data by like how many cars we sold and how many cars were you know four wheel drive versus two wheel drive and that's when it becomes challenging to get market share of differential assembly mm -hmm. and your first okay. part of the question I, I, again we have to go back to the map i'll just uh, answer that You know, while you're going to the map, the reason I ask this is I'm just trying to understand. Given the opportunity size is growing so quickly, um, you know, how should we think about the market share in this category? And you know, this whole uh, you know opportunity in the compact vehicles, which you touched upon last time. Uh, you know, how should we think about that? I'm just trying to get some sense. You know, if I have to uh, think about you know next two three years. Uh, there is going to be some normalization of market share, you know, as the market is expanding so fast. So you maybe, you know, just share some thoughts around this. So I get your question, Gunjan, and I would say market share is not the way to look at it because in a very fast expanding market, it isn't really market share, but you should look at absolute revenue. And is that growing fast enough and are there new programs being added? And uh, to be honest, the very, very few that are, we are not in either gear or differential assembly, both. The point for us at least, the strategy is, see, I know to the outside world, it may be that, oh, let's take one product differential assembly, how much market share, try to figure that out, then gear. It is in every electric car out there. We need to be either differential assembly, preferably, but if not, through other guys who are our competitors in differential assemblies, try to get in the gears. That's that's our approach right now. It's maximized to the extent possible, and which is why. So you see the North America. We have four customers and eight programs. Three are in serial production, means these have peaked already. So these programs. Uh, the production rate is not going to increase. The five that are there, which says in order book, means some of them have not started, and some of them have started but have not reached uh, peak potential. That's what it means. How many are active? I can't tell top of my mind. Uh, Pratik, would you know how many of these are like have begun production? The total that would be, uh, I think, six. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying, because something that begins, let's say, this quarter will not ramp up to full production at least for a year. So that will continue to, that's why we made it light blue instead of white, that circle. I, we thought it would give some clarity, even we have doubts on this one, that how do we represent it? In Europe also, we have two unique customers for uh, the DA, and this is just DA, not gear. In Asia, again, so the opportunity will continue to increase. I don't think we should be very fast about the market share. As an analyst who tracks performance, I think, and even us internally as management, we track, is the revenue growing fast enough? And are we increasing the number of total programs? Because very hard to right now bet on who will win five years out and which which programs will win, which customers will win. That's a hard thing. So right now our strategy is to get in almost as many as possible. 
ओके गॉट इट द सेकंड क्वेश्चन इज फॉर रोहित रोहित यू यू नो यू शो द दी 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 मार्जिन यू नो हेट बिकॉज ऑफ यू नो बिकॉज ऑफ दैट डिनोमिनेटर इफेक्ट बट आई मीन कीपिंग ऑल दैट असाइड आई एम जस्ट यू नो देर इज बीन अ मिक्स इम्प्रूवमेंट विद बी वी इज इंक्रीजिंग इज देर यू नो इज देर अ ह्यूज decline that we have seen in the starter motor business because you know that's where the hit is coming from so is it just because of the commodity inflation or it is also because we're trying to expand our market you know market share so we are going into uh, you know newer geographies so you know more sustainably how should we think about margins so i think our guidance on the margins remains within you know the margin range that we've stated which is 26 to 28% uh so as you know we do not actually separately uh, you know uh, talk about uh, individual business uh, volumes or numbers etc so we actually don't do that in section but uh i mean maybe partially answering your question so if you look at uh, the margin impact of positive impact of product mix so this is this 2% is uh, net of everything so it includes if there is any adverse impact uh, on an inferior product mix sort of uh, going up and on the other side some positive gain so this 2% is a net impact of that so on the whole the product mix uh, i mean it's not only the bev part bev of course is uh, contributing but uh, even otherwise also product mix has uh, changed for better during the quarter okay got it i'll join back with you thank you yeah but good and fair question i think what we can say at this stage is it should remain between that 26 to 28 14 to 16 14 to 16 pack 26 to 28 a bit tough we have managed within this range for the last 5 years and we don't see it uh, we don't see much risk in the near term i mean as your uh, as reading one of your notes you also expect commodity prices to soften so it should ease from here on but time will tell uh, where commodity is going okay got it thank you so much the next question is from uh, mr chirag shah chirag your line is unmuted please go ahead thank you for the opportunity two question uh question one the new product that you have showcased uh so this 405 odd crore revenue that we are indicating this represents what kind of volume <laughs> uh and the question one is why the sop is so back ended I mean, is it the completely new line that is coming a new model that is getting launched or is it tied to that or yes, can you explain that that why it is so back ended from 25 and you said sir up whatever you say we'll explain but we can't give price away right because i mean you have to understand this is a public thing and our competitors are also going to look at this transcript and say oh these guys price this much let me price five dollars below so obviously if i give you volume i've given you value you'll get to price right so that's they'll be shooting myself in the foot and all of you who are investors in the foot too so that we can't do and 25 i think that's fairly uh, that's how automotive is if you get a new order most uh, from getting the order to sop is a 18 to 24 month cycle for uh, any new program right and yes it is a new uh, it's a new model because see, we are only making the imcm the motor software and controller part of it but the whole system has to be changed means pura uh, so suspension which as see everything has to be reworked the vehicle on board controller the vehicle computer so the uh, the system is far more sophisticated than the part we are making we are making one part of it which to us is quite sophisticated but the overall thing is very very smart i mean imagine this thing is predicting that because it looked at the map and it knows that there is a pothole and it automatically adjusts your chassis so that you will never feel that why is it more important as vehicles become more autonomous is when a human driver swerves to avoid a pothole you know you excuse the driver 
But if a robo taxi or a automatic autonomous vehicle does that, you would think something wrong with the vehicle. So as things become more autonomous, uh, a lot more systems have to become smarter. And it's a journey, right? You've seen that earlier in vehicles, a lot of functions were done by the human being. If you needed to move your window up, your hand's energy uh, used to crank that thing. I mean, starter motors ke pehle used to actually crank the engine to start it. So it took human potential and kinetic energy to actually function. Slowly that got given to mechanical, then later hydraulic, and then later electro-hydraulic and electromechanical parts. I think we are moving when it is smart electronic hardware parts, where the decision to move also is being taken by the machine or the system itself. And this is a journey that's been continuing for the last 30 years and will continue going up. Why we say it's an opportunity is because we feel that these kind of disruptions suddenly take away the legacy advantage. You know, if you've been making suspension systems for 50 years, uh, you're not disrupted. Suddenly this new thing comes, somebody from outside that field is also capable of doing it. Which is why I think there is great opportunity for people who can move quickly and hopefully we will be able to keep doing uh, these new products and keep innovating so that we are not constrained by the how much market share of which product type questions and we can you know start delivering our own journey. This is, this is helpful. And sir, who would be your competitors in this? Are there any competitors uh, in this kind of product? Not that we know of. Uh, so active suspension systems have been around. A lot of, I mean, uh, if you go on Wikipedia, you will see that a lot of people, a lot of OEMs have tried to do it. Uh, mostly it's in-house OEMs. I mean, if you want our competition, it will be OEMs themselves. Uh, that they also do some version of it. But we are a supplier of that system. So I... I don't know. Sat, you want to add here something? Uh, anyway, it will be very difficult right now to say who will be the competitor. Uh, but yeah, definitely, uh, I mean, uh, OEMs were doing this uh, for uh, uh, some of their high-end uh, applications. But uh, I think uh, it's very difficult to, at this point of time, to say who the competition will be. Yeah. Uh, so, Chirag, I mean, Obviously, so for Sat and his team and who they've developed this, it is a matter of fairly good pride. I know, I mean, you know, the, take the commerce part of it out and take what impact it has on other things, uh, material things. But a company from India is making a product that we are now discussing, is there competition or not? That itself is a fairly, fairly big thing. Uh, for an engineering company, that we are doing something so new that we don't really have competition. There isn't really that big a market also because it is brand new as a system. But these things will will increase over time. No, sir, it's, it's a great achievement, no doubt about it. The fact that you are launching this kind of a product itself is a great achievement. There's no way. So, sir, second question was on the DHG motor. You know, you had indicated that there are vehicle level trials underway. Uh, any any update on that side, and when can we see some traction on that? Because that itself is a really big opportunity for us. True. So I mean, although how much we have budgeted from it for the next year, we've already got through this. So anything that comes will be great. Uh, but no positive news uh, so far to actually report. As you know, we like to keep things to ourselves unless it is definite and it is a purchase order. So no point, uh, you know, pounding chickens before they hatch. When we get it, we will report. You know that. It's the last question, if I can speak, it's for Rohit. Well, EBITDA margins are not necessarily the right way of looking the business you have to through. So as, a, as an analyst, what is the number that we should look at? So you rightly pointed that the margins, given the new, the new impact, can keep on fluctuating based on how things, how commodities behave. 
So internally, what do you monitor and uh, what is the number or the parameter that needs to be monitored? Look, the numbers we monitor are uh, EBITDA and PAT only. I mean, from the profitability standpoint, of course, there are multiple other parameters. But if as an analyst, you are looking at it, I think EBITDA basically uh, is a core business profitability and how we are deploying capital will kind of flow down uh, up to the PAT level. So these are the two key indicators we also track. And we feel EBITDA margin is important because like I pointed out, seasonally the revenue will uh, go up and down but uh, since we are quite committed to you know reasonably high return on capital and uh, equity so that is something which is for us uh, a key focus area so chirag i'll answer it in a different way ebitda is the right metric I, although just personally i think ebit is a better metric for manufacturing companies especially which are fast growing Uh, you shouldn't let depreciation affect that because if it is going towards growth capex. However, let's stick to that. I think a better answer is that if you look at it from a slightly longer time frame, if you look at this business from a three-year lens and see the EBITDA as a range rather than a every quarter what it is, because commodity prices do have a large numerator denominator effect. I think that would be the better way, which is why if you notice every time we are asked, we always say 26 to 28. We don't actually uh, talk about a point because we do understand that it goes up and down without much actually changing uh, because of just the mathematical impact of it. And uh, look in auto, like you asked me, why is it taking two years? This is how it is. It isn't a very quarter-on-quarter quarter tracking business because no programs are also short-term. Once you win a business, it is going to be there for six to seven years and in driveline case, 10 to 15 years. So it is a more, uh, like I said, but you know, we are new to capital markets, so we won't try to say more that it is YTD is a usually a much better way to look at businesses than every quarter. Because there is also, you saw that, yeah, there is huge seasonality. If you are focused towards US and Europe, uh, December has the Christmas holidays and it will have that impact. Uh, in Europe, August has uh, holidays, so European market will have that impact. So these are things that are there and that are part of the industry cycle. It is a cyclical uh, industry. But yeah, I mean, over a three-year time, uh, the range should hold. If that is getting depleted, then it's uh, something that's changing in the structure of the business. And that's something to watch out for. Uh, the next question is from Priya Ranjan. Uh, Priya, your line is uh, unmuted. Kindly go ahead. Hello. Hello. Hi, Priyanjan. Actually, I have typed in. Actually, I was traveling, so I thought <laughs> the question should be in this question box. Uh, okay. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Can you read it out? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, the question is: Can you visualize the share of e two wheelers and three wheelers? in the overall business after two to three years based on current order book and assumption of electrification. Acquisition of new product is for totally new customer or new program for existing customer? Sorry, that's many questions. Uh, okay, let's just keep taking it one by one. What is the first part? Can you visualize what would be the market share in electric two-wheeler space? Yeah, in the overall business, uh, after two, three, two to three years, what would be the share of E two wheelers and three wheelers? Mm. And uh, whatever is your assumption of uh, electrification based on that? Rohit, would you like to take that? So, in our revenue, what percentage of our revenue is electric two wheeler, three wheeler? In let's say FY twenty four. 
uh, I think it was 5% is what we had taken. Yeah. I mean, if you take three wheelers and two wheelers and three wheelers, a couple or just two wheelers? Two, uh, two wheelers and three wheelers. I mean, we started off with, I think, 5% assumption, uh, at least our internal thing. I think you can give a broad range, that will also help. Investors just get the direction. Yeah, uh, I think it'll be around 10%. Uh, that's the number broadly I'll go with, but Priyanjan, I'll reach out to you and answer this uh, more specifically, because I'll have to Look at the math. Actually, see, this keeps changing because we just won two new programs this quarter on electric three-wheelers. Now I have to see how much they ramp up to in FY24 and then add that revenue to the projection that we already made. So it's quite dynamic. But 10%, I guess, should be a safe one. It should be slightly higher than that. Now, what is the second part, Kapil? Uh, this is acquisition of new product. Is this for totally new customer or a new program for the existing customer? Acquisition of new product? I, I, I believe... Uh, I will be sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we are. So, the new... Uh, what I wanted to ask is whether this new program is... Or the new product which we have asked is for the... New program for a new customer or new program for an existing customer? Oh, it's uh, this new product, right? This active suspension motor, this is for a brand new customer. Great, great. Actually, yeah, this one was pretty cool in that sense that we also added uh, three new customers who weren't customers before. So, which was which pretty uh, remarkable in just a three-month period. And the geography, if you can mention would that I mentioned that uh, for new program when we mentioned that chart that one okay so I'll just repeat the four new programs that we have won one is the differential assembly program for an existing customer in the European market one new program which is a e axle program that's for the Indian uh, market three wheeler customer a motor and a controller program another uh, L5 variety uh, three-wheeler Indian customer. And the fourth is that motor program, which is for the European market, a uh, brand new customer. That These were the four. Great, great. Thanks, Vivek. That's all for me. Thanks, Piranjan. The next question is from Narottam Garg. Narottam, your line is unmuted. Now kindly go ahead. Hi, Vivek. Hi, Director. How are you, man? I'm good. Thank you. And uh, congratulations on, uh, you know, this integrated suspension order win. Uh, I think it's a big validation of, uh, you know, us moving into the technology leadership aspect. I just wanted to understand what kind of product complexity and in-car integration does this product involve? If you could, uh, you know, comment on this. And the complexity on, you know, just supplying hardware-based products to now hardware plus software-based products. Or does this change, you know, your, you know, profile as a as a tier one supplier? So just wanted to get a sense on these two. Good question, and I will let the person who's done this answer it and actually take the credit instead of me talking about it. Sat, uh, over to you, sir. Yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, the pro uh, the product is a very very technologically uh, uh, advanced product, and it encompasses. Uh, uh, mechanical, electrical, uh, hardware, electronics, and uh, and software, and uh, this comes with uh, a lot of uh, additional features. I mean, uh, or or the requirement, uh, it has to be in AutoSAR compliant. It has to be uh, 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 SLC and SLD uh, in terms of the safety of the product, and uh, uh, it will. Uh, I mean. Uh, it will take uh, a lot of our efforts and engineering uh, resources and the knowledge uh, to fully develop this product uh, and uh, 
the response time uh, for this motor to react is in uh, milliseconds because it's predicting uh, uh, the future and uh, the the, uh, the bumps and uh, uh, potholes on the road, uh, the uneven surface on the road, and reacting to it. And it has to integrate uh, with the motor controllers. It has to uh, integrate with the uh, ECU uh, and the uh, the master uh, uh, controller or inverter uh, of the vehicle, along with the uh, the sensors uh, in the car. So it's a very very uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, system uh, and the module, and uh, it's. Uh, uh, reaction time is, as I said, I mean, it's uh, so fast. I mean, uh, and the motor's uh, durability is, has to be uh, at the highest level uh, uh, during the operation. So it's a uh, very, very uh, sophisticated product. Hope I answered uh, the questions here. So it's, to add to what Sat said, so there are two very challenging aspects to it. One is, of course, the software part of integrating all this and integrating with all the various other moving parts in the vehicle, including the sensors. And the second is the thermal management. Now, that learning came to us because we did that hard work on the BSC system, etc. because motors are notoriously get hot, especially if you move so much. So these are the two things that make it a complex engineering problem and uh, yeah it, it's it is uh, challenging and hence worth doing and hence also commercially uh, you know uh, profitable so uh, that's great Vivek. Uh, one more question uh, which we need to get some sense on is uh, are you working on this product for other OEMs or other programs of the same OEM as well and second the addition, the huge addition on the software engineer side, if you could comment on, you know, what kind of, uh, I know you can't talk about specific projects, but broadly, if you could talk about, you know, why, why is such a big addition of software engineer? Is it that you're moving towards more hardware plus software integration in the overall product profile? Some sense on that, if you could share. So, yes, I think I did mention that uh, by the time 2026 rolls around and you know, if you heard our IPO conversation, we said that 2030, it was our target to have the motor business give us more revenue from traction motors and other type of motors that go into electrified vehicles rather than the starter motors which are in IC. It is a deliberate business strategy to take away the IC phase-out risk much faster than anybody else so that we're not caught short. We are reaching that goal in 2026. However, all of these new motors, if you look at uh, this active suspension motor that we spoke about right now, uh, traction motors, because they come with motor controllers again, all of them have a lot of software integration because the controller has a lot of functions that it has to tell the motor when to draw power from the battery, give it back to the battery. It has to manage the communication of the motor with the vehicle. It has to do the what Sat mentioned about AutoSAR, ACLC, ACLD, the functional safety elements. It has to monitor the uh, health of it. Cybersecurity is a big one. So, because I mean, these are moving vehicles. If you can act into them, you have actually made literal weapons which are in somebody else's power that can control them. I mean, 9 11 was. Two planes, right, which were physically overtaken. Here, sitting remote control, if you can control these vehicles and thousands of motors and you can use them to take them wherever you want, that's a big, big national security risk. So cybersecurity protocols to build into these motors become far more important. So as we move from, I would say, less intelligent parts to smarter parts, uh, the kind of engineer and the kind of talent we would need keeps uh, changing, which is why that big ramp up. I think we put out a job requirement for 50 new roles in the last quarter, uh, and all of them are around that area. Uh, cybersecurity, functional safety, hardware integration, testing, R uh, software. This is, this is the new normal.
Sure, Vivek. Thank you, and you know, good luck with. Thanks, Arthur. The next question is from Vinayak Mota. Vinayak, your line is unmuted now. Kindly go ahead. I, Hi, Vinayak. Yes. Uh, yeah, I guess he's, as we can't hear him. <laughs> Let me read out the question. Uh, where do you think the two-wheeler segment could move towards? It has currently moved from 0.1% uh, to 1%. Just want an understanding on the future aspect of the same. So we take two-wheeler, three-wheeler as a category. It should become about 10% of our revenue in FY24. Uh, the same answer I gave to Priranjan. Beyond that, we can't really say. It may be a little less if electrification uh, is slower than anticipated. However, looking at policy and government intent, it doesn't look like it will be slower. It may be faster. Sure, uh, Juliet, we can move on to the next one. The next question is from Anup Gulanika. Anup, your line is unmuted. Now kindly go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, the order book which was displayed in the uh, beginning of the slide showed that the order book is 176 billion. Can I just get an understanding over what period which the revenue will be recognized? So, uh, I, I, oh, sorry, I didn't do that preamble this time because this was the third quarter. So we do, first two quarters, we explain exactly how it is. So I'll just read out. It is in the note below. Uh, the net order book is basically the aggregate revenue from, I'm actually reading, uh, so from awarded programs, which are either yet to start production or yet to fully ramp up in the next 10 years. After, and this is why we call it net order book, after adjusting the negative program, uh, negative value of all programs that are reaching end of life or being phased out. And then we also apply a reasonable, I would say, discount. Uh, because if you add up all the orders from customers, customers as they should be are all fairly optimistic. So you have to apply your reasonableness in kind of calculating what it should be. Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I actually didn't need, uh, read the note below. Thank you for your explanation. That no, 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 it's not your uh, thing to read. I just thought that, you know, we said, said this twice, so I didn't want to say it again. Uh, uh, thank, thank you so much, sir. That, uh, that's it from my side. It was our miss, not yours. Juliet, can we take the next one? Uh, okay, let me let me read out a few from the Q and A box. Um, okay, do you see supply chain related uh, issues due to container availability? Yes. Is the short answer, long answer is, uh, but we are managing, I mean, all of this is despite all this, freight rates are two to three times uh, what they used to be, but we are managing. Uh, and, you know, that is literally the job of management. These things will happen. Uh, there will be headwinds. And we have to see how much uh, we can do despite all of these difficulties. And there will not be a time in which there are no difficulties. At all, so something or the other will always happen. But yeah, it's an ongoing issue. However, the bigger issue, uh, the biggest issue, is continues to be uh, the issue of lower sales because of our customers' uh, supply chain issues. Okay, uh, we have another one from uh, Pragya Shah. Any update for magnetless, magnetless motors? Uh, yes, I'll ask Mr. Deshmukh to elaborate, but before that, yeah, we have tried for 
phase already of making magnetless motors and we have failed in those four. So now we know four ways that it won't work. Uh, one way it worked, it gave the required output, but it was too big and heavy. In one way, the efficiency wasn't good enough. One way, the torque wasn't good enough. So yeah, we we are continuing uh, to try. Mr. Deshmukh, you want to add something, sir? Uh, we have sort of, uh, I mean, this is a journey and uh, like any R&D project, uh, you have to try many, you have to do experimentation and you have to try many things and something works, something doesn't work. So there is a learning. So there is a progress that is happening and we are now building some uh, proof of concept prototypes and they will be tested. And if we succeed, then probably next meeting, next call, we will be maybe in a position to say something about it. There is a progress happening and uh, the progress, of course, is uh, because there are many options and there are many uh, technological challenges uh, and you have to overcome one after another. Okay, uh, we have another one from Mohit. Can you comment on the CapEx plans and how they are going on? What is the capacity utilization? Uh, Rohit? Yeah, sure. So CapEx, we had given uh, an update last time. Uh, we actually had revised our estimated uh, CapEx number for this year uh, down from 650 to 450 crores. Uh, so right now that's where we are we feel that our final capex for the year will be ballpark in that range and in terms of capacity utilization uh, so for our uh, driveline business if i look at uh, on the gear side our capacity utilization would be about 80 percent uh, differential assembly capacity utilization will be actually 100 percent plus and uh, on the motor business side, uh, I think the capacity utilization is uh, about for 50% uh, for the last quarter. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, this question okay, is from... One request. Uh, we will today, there is no time limit. Let's take every single question that is there. <laughs> Uh, because I do get requests from people afterwards that they won't, weren't called out. So let's have everyone. Uh, I mean, it's important. Look, when you have a quarter in which you have like very, very good financial growth, etc. Maybe you don't need to answer so many questions. But when it's been a flag quarter like this one, I think we owe it to uh, people to answer every single question that we can. So we'll be here till every question is answered. Sure. Uh, next question is from uh, Jinesh. Uh, on your expanded technology roadmap, can you elaborate on timelines for getting into autonomous connected with vehicle components? Which components are you targeted for targeting for this new segment? Sure. So uh, this active suspension one is in a way an autonomous. Uh, Product because what does autonomous mean again? Like I said, it's not the end goal of a robot taxi. It is what does it take for a vehicle to become autonomous? First level is hands and feet removal. The second is eye. The third is the brain. Right? That's that's you're taking the human being out of the uh, equation. So we are already on it. Uh, next, as we have put, there are bots which are also for wider applications which we may look at. Uh, like I said, mobility definition does not have to be constrained to automotive and within automotive, not only a car, anything that moves, a device that moves people or goods from point A to point B for us is mobility and motors that can go in or gears or gearboxes that can go into these uh, components and make them more intelligent, uh, all of them are open. It isn't a definite, defined roadmap. We are evolving as a company. We are evolving our roadmap. And it will continue to change. Uh, innovation cannot be held to a standard and said, here is a map and, you know, let's make this. It often happens by serendipity, like this one. We were out to make the VHG system. 
and ended up making an application that we haven't actually thought of when we went towards it. So it, it will change. Yes, the intent, like I said, is there. And as vehicles become autonomous and connected, we will seek our opportunities in that area. And as we identify specific products, we will keep adding to that. That's why we left so much white space on that product roadmap is so that we can fill it. And when we do, as we said to you, everyone, and we always keep repeating, we will transparently share with you as it's evolving our successes as well as our failings. So we, we're not going to hide anything. Sure. Uh, next question is from Anka Mittal. Uh, good evening, everyone. My question is regarding new program win having peak value of 405 crores. When will this project start contributing to top line? SOP is FY25. Uh, so yeah, then uh, I think it's written on that slide, but FY25, it won't reach peak in FY25. Uh, peak should be FY26, but it'll start contributing in FY25. Okay. Uh, this question is from Anirban. Is the company looking to acquire any foreign players in overlapping segments to cater to European players or looking to bundle products from other manufacturers and export composites rather than individual components so that some premium can be charged? That's a very specific strategy suggestion instead of a question. But Anirvan, thank you uh, for that. I mean, look, acquisitions, unless they are done, they are not done, right? So it is very binary. We can have all the intent in the world. We can target a few companies, but only when is it completed, signed, then it will be, uh, it is worth sharing also. So intent alone cannot solve transactions. Uh, so we will, we will uh, share when it is relevant and ready to be shared. Okay, uh, this question is from Karan. Uh, Tesla often mentions that software re revenue typically is a higher margin in nature and has potential to significantly enhance overall margin profile as it scales up. Will our supply of software solutions for autonomous vehicles materially enhance our margin profile ahead? So look, in general, let's just take it generally, Anything that is replicable infinite number of times is always going to be more profitable. So when we say that every IMCM has 2 million lines of code, what you have to remember is I don't have to write this 2 million lines of code again. It is written once and now if we have only one motor module sold, that's hard luck to us and we'll probably never recover money. But after a while, Every other iteration of a product sold is at no additional cost. Yes, we will continue to have to update those systems, keep adding it, keep making it more elegant. Uh, but that is the inherent beauty or power of technology or software. It compounds over time as the cost gets distributed per unit sold and the profit margin keeps increasing. That is the power of anything that has uh, software driving. Actually, that is the power of anything that has technology driving. When you acquire technology for the first time, like we did with, let's say, Precision 40, it takes a lot of effort and our margins kept improving because that same technology is being applied over time and over each iteration, your initial cost gets amortized. So, it is the nature of it and of course, software has the most replicable. So yeah, that's that's uh, that's in general the question. It doesn't matter if we do it or who does. Okay, this question is from Arun. What is the accuracy of 1.7 billion order book for 10 years? For example, in the last three quarters, is it on track with the project projections? So in normal times, I would have said it is uh, within plus minus. Like I said, we've already baked in some conservative estimates to ensure that it is always online. It's just that last two years, 
uh, in the automotive world have been, well, I think in any industry, have been so up and down that things are more dynamic and the standard deviation of error are far larger than they used to be. Uh, but yeah, plus minus 5% on a 10-year basis because the thing that affects these kind of things is usually delays in program. But delays in program do not last you know, like you can, if you try to make it very specific to a year or a quarter, programs often get delayed in their launch, but not in a 10 year time frame. So it's, it makes the degree of error far less. Okay, uh, let's go back and take some of the questions from the question queue. Uh, Siddharth, can you take a few questions? Yeah, let's take from Naresh uh, Sutar. Uh, Naresh, your line is unmuted. Uh, you can ask the question. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Uh, partly it has been answered. So it is uh, regarding the future product uh, slide which you are sharing. Uh, 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 can you share uh, how many of these future products uh, have already uh, crossed the R&D hurdle and are nearing the commercialization uh, uh, will be helpful? So some of them you have already mentioned like magnetless and others. So yeah. No, so magnetless would also still be R&D only. So, Mr. Deshpok, you can explain the slide. Pratik, you can put that slide on. See, if it is in white, it is not in commercial production yet. No, no, I'm saying it might. Uh, okay, it's, uh, the R&D stage is still not over. That yes, they're all in what, R&D. Whatever is in white is in R&D currently. Yeah. Once it gets commercialized, it will come into the blue. Understood. Uh, and and uh, of of the products which we already uh, have commercialized uh, in the blue, uh, in let us say, uh, how many uh, programs uh, are in discussion, like a future potential funnel, if you want to understand. So all of them have many future programs as well. Even actually, forget the blue, even the black ones, they continue. No, no, to what I, what I mean, uh, what I meant was, uh, like this quarter we have won four uh, programs. So likewise, uh, you must be having active discussion with your many customers. So uh, any uh, funnel number you want to give? Uh, no, no. Any, uh, because see, the, this is the thing I mentioned the last quarter. Uh, these things uh, happen over a period of time. Like we won for this quarter, but it isn't that we started the conversation this quarter. Most of these conversations have been happening for a year or more. They just concluded this quarter. So there is a lot of conversations. I mean, that number would be lots, like in dozens and dozens of conversations going on. When they end, it also may be that there is a quarter when nothing happens. You have nothing that you conclude and no new wins. That can also happen. So they get bunched up sometimes. I think last quarter itself in Q2, what happened was we had very few new wins in the last quarter. Uh, this one, we were fortunate that many programs concluded. So that, that will happen. I think it's more prudent to look at it on a year basis. So these conversations, all of them, like I keep saying, are 12 to 18 month conversations to conclude. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is from uh, Hitesh Goel of CLSA. Uh, Hitesh, please go ahead. Hi, hi Vivek, hi Rohit, good evening. Uh, hi Hitesh, good evening. how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Uh, so my questions are uh, basically just uh, wanted to understand from you, you know, the globally we are seeing mechanical parts getting shifted to uh, electric parts, right? Especially in EVs. I know, you know, you are already thinking about it, but just wanted to get a sense that if the driveline business actually shifts to a motor business, which is not something we are seeing across the board right now, very, very few one or two, uh, you know, OEMs globally have started doing that. But what is the cost economics here? How do you think about it? And how are you preparing organizations for that? So I think I... I answered this question in the other way when I think Nitin was asking me ki, what is the potential of the active suspension motors. Same thing. So to replace mechanical parts with electrical and electronic parts, let's say you take the hub wheel motor or a quad motor thing, 
and put that concept and take away the two differentials. Your cost goes up by four to five times per vehicle. It does enhance top delivery because you've given four independent torque uh, delivery points. However, the cost is very high for anyone except a E or F segment player to do it. So it is limited to that, which is the same thing. So this has a counterpoint to it that if we make such a product, our opportunity is also limited by that same thing. So our risk and opportunity are both, I think, in that. Over time, I also did add that maybe in 20, 25 years, it will change significantly if people find ways. Because what are you doing? You're taking two differential assemblies, which is essentially a set of gears, and replacing them with four independent motors, which are all smart. It's an expensive, fairly expensive solution, to be honest. Okay. For a game that will not be relevant for many vehicles. It is relevant for, let's say, highly torque-hungry SUVs, which have to do off-roading, etc. Similar to this, how much is the ideal market? Like Even in this, by the way, there is a step. That's the extreme step, right? They replace mechanical completely and put electronics in. There is a mid-path, which is the electronic differential lock or the EDL. Uh, which is kind of an electronic, electromechanical part. So we are on that, that we are migrating to that uh, ourselves. Yeah, my impression was also that I just wanted your thoughts on it. My second question is actually uh, that one of your big customers in BEV is actually on a con call in the recent earnings con call has alluded to the fact that they are also now seeing uh, chip shortage becoming an issue, which they actually did very well in CY21, right? They were the only guys who grew significantly where other guys declined, right? But they have also talked about delaying some of their launches uh, because of chip shortage issue and maybe uh, scaling up production to not to the extent which market is expecting. So have you, did you, uh, up, uh, you know, are you also seeing some impact of that going forward, uh, uh, you know, in your business or, uh, you know, you are on track on uh, what you have guided in the past? say for FI24, FI25 kind of numbers? So, Hitesh, you know, we won't take customer-specific questions, and it is their strategy and their problem, and they will guide uh, the market as they do. But in general, I can answer that uh, this chip shortage thing is not something that affects one person. It's affecting everyone. We have various estimates from all the customers we talk to, some people are getting out of it as early as Q3 uh, of this calendar year. And some are going to take till Q2 of next calendar year. So it, it's a spectrum, but for everyone, this is a problem. I don't think there is anyone I know who's uh, completely uh, untouched by this. Great, great. Uh, congratulations, all the best for the new order. Yeah. Thank you, Desh. Thank you. Uh, we'll take the next question from Mahesh uh, Bendra of IDBI. Mahesh, you can go ahead. Uh, Mahesh, you are not audible. Uh, Hi, Mahesh. Yeah, we can. Yeah. I, let me read out. He has put in Q&A box as well. Yeah. When will four European customers with whom we have received orders start contributing to our sales? Sorry? When will the four, when will the four European customers from whom we have received orders start contributing to our sales? So one of them, just go back to that chart again. Actually, these are very, very specific questions. So, uh, I don't think we also... Uh, yeah, three, right? Okay. So, I like one extra has been added. Uh, they are... One is already active but not ramped up. And two are yet to start production. Uh, one is well-known, we said, FY25 for uh, the active suspension one. 
And the other one will happen, I guess, in uh, the thing is it FY23 or FY24? Oh, it could be FY24. FY24. So, one active ramping up, one FY24 and one FY25. Uh, we can take the next question from Nilesh uh, uh, Shah. Uh, Nilesh, your line is unmuted. Great, thank you. Uh, just need your help in understanding the uh, yeah, you know, uh, the revenue cuts, right? So one thing that I am seeing is that the QOQ growth in North America is fairly high, about 61 odd per, 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 a, a cent, right? Uh, but we don't see a commensurate QOQ growth, say, in your... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, like in, in your, yeah, you know, on the gears and 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 assembly side. So, so just having a bit of trouble in reconciling this. If you could help with that. So, Nilesh, really, to be completely transparent, I don't think we look at these data cuts Q on Q our business is not very quarter oriented okay because if you think about it all programs are running and right. now let's say you have one customer with which you have a and the geographies also for that matter one customer one program that is the same platform used in every market globally in some quarter like that customer says you know what i have enough uh, inventory in this market, why don't you supply everything to the other market? We'll do that. And these mixes will change. The point is, when you have, I mean, you're uh, seeing our answers in everything when people are saying, oh, you have won this, when will it start? It takes two years to start, it takes two years to win. But when it comes, it also stays for 10 years. So not much changes. The things we have to watch out for are, first order problem, are vehicles being sold in the world or not? That affects everyone and it, that includes us. Right. Second, are customers' vehicles being sold? And the third, which is more of a motor business uh, issue, which is the third level of abstraction, which is, are the platforms or models uh, that I supply to within that customer, are they being sold more or less? And it keeps changing from week to week. And right now, because supply is a constraint, what many OEMs are doing is they are prioritizing certain models which have more profit per unit. See, for an OEM, it is how much revenue did I produce this quarter? Let's say you have only 100 chips. The demand is for 200 vehicles. What you'll do is you'll make 100 units which have maximum per unit profit. Now, because you've done that, you choose models. You don't make all 200. For a component guy, the volume matters and which model you're on. So if you're not on that model that has been prioritized by the OEM, for that quarter you'd be left out. But my request is, I don't think there is much, uh, much inference or insight to be gained on quarter on quarter market shift or customer shift because a lot of it is also we do for clarity and transparency try to put programs by geography a lot of them are becoming global programs so you supply to multiple locations from the same uh, same part same program and then you know customer decides that do they want those delivered in that geography or for that end market or not uh, yeah i mean i see what you are saying but my my question was that in one of your large geographies, right, where you basically sell three product lines, right, you sell can differential. You go back, one second, Nilesh. Uh, we can go back to that slide. See, all geographies are pretty much equal, number one. I don't think there is like, yeah, that's, no, Pratik, this is not the slide. Let's talk about diversification slide and Q on Q growth. Yeah, right. So, North America, India, 
Asia, Europe, they're pretty much all equal. It's uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm not questioning that. I'm just see, uh, see the point that I am uh, trying to kind of just understand better from you is that in Q1 and Q2 you did about 140 crores in uh, you know in that geography that has suddenly gone up to 220, right? I mean, uh, so so it it's it's not to kind of you know, pinpoint which customer and all. I'm just trying to understand, has something uh, changed in terms of something new ramping up, right? Or or you, yeah, you know, you made a point about some OEM, you know, uh, choosing to produce more in, in North America versus Europe, right? So just trying to make sense of this ramp up, you know, Q1, Q2 versus Q3. <laughs> I think it's more a question of what has reduced rather than what has increased. So actually, this is a relative thing, right? Because this is common sense to 100 because it's a percentage. Uh, I don't think there is anything that has increased a lot in North America. I think other markets have shrunk much more. Hence, that looks like it has increased more. I uh, I don't know the absolute. No, number. I did the math. I mean, I converted these percentages. A any, anyways, I I see your, uh, you know, I take uh, this broader message from you to not scrutinize these quarterly. Uh, but if I still fail to understand something, I will reconnect. No, please come back and actually let me ask Gohit to help you out here because uh, I personally haven't looked at uh, this cut because. Any analysis that doesn't yield specific actions uh, to us is not very meaningful to us as management. Right, so right, right. I haven't done that. But Rohit, uh, do you know? I actually don't even remember what it was at the end of Q2, which is why I'm also at the loss. About 140 crore was the North America revenue for Q2. Any, anyways, uh, I will, uh, yeah, you know, I will, you know, <laughs> reconnect if I need yeah. any further clarity. I, Rohit, uh, I think he's not here. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, what I was saying was, uh, actually, I think it's it's the answer that you gave. I also don't have the data which he's looking at, but my sense is it is because of uh, the redistribution of uh, the supply chain uh, by some customer. Okay, thank you. The next question is from uh, Sunil Bojwani. Sunil, your line is unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, Vivek. It's an absolute delight to always hear you on your phone calls. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. I have a question regarding the recall. So if any of the OEMs have their vehicle recalls, due to a faulty product or faulty equipment of ours. So what exactly happens in that case? Who bears the cost and has it ever happened in the past? So, uh, scary question. Uh, has not happened in my uh, my tenure. Uh, Mr. Deshmukh has been in this industry for 40 years, so I'd, I'd ask him to answer because I don't have any knowledge or experience. Well, uh... It has never happened in Sona BLW. And uh, so, but if there is a recall on account of our product being defective, obviously we will have to bear the expenses. It will depend upon the contract, particular contract with the customer. Uh, but in past uh, so many years, we never had any such problem. Okay, that that's good news. So basically, is contract specific? Yeah, and I, I, I if it don't have anyone on legal on the call, but I think it is limited to the value or the sum total of value of parts supplied. So I think there is a limitation that we try to build in the contracts. Rohit, would you have any idea? Because we we haven't. Uh, we no, did not have had any instance uh, like this. But from others, would Vikram, Sat, have you seen others in the industry? Because it should be the same for everyone. 
well personally i have experienced uh, long ago in sona steering when there was a call a recall on account of a defective uh, steering and uh, at that time actually what happens the practical issue here is it's very difficult to pinpoint who is the uh, who is to blame or where the actual problem lies because ultimately the parts that we make go into a system and then it go into a larger system which is automobile and very often uh, who is responsible if it is the product or it is the assembly of the product on the vehicle or it is interaction with another system so it it is a complex uh, matter uh, but uh, so therefore it is very difficult to answer this question but uh, in short i think it is the agreement with the customer uh, which di- dictates these things okay okay that helps and my second question is a follow up to the active uh, suspension product how is it different than the ad- adaptive suspension and is it uh, a more value added kind of adf adaptive suspension and i am assuming that this one new product has added three new customers so they must be the luxury car segments or the luxury vehicle segment am i am i correct in reading that so it is currently only one customer uh, the other programs that were added were for differential assembly e axle and motor controller separately there were four new programs and one was for this it is just one customer and you are correct that the end vehicle is a luxury uh, luxury vehicle uh but for the first part of it mr deshmukh if you uh... mr deshmukh yeah sorry I can you repeat that... i i i couldn't get get your question yeah i was asking that how is it different from the adaptive suspension and uh, is it uh, an advanced level of adaptive suspension this active suspension uh module that we have made or yeah, so, exactly uh, can you throw a little light firstly i think there are different kinds of systems uh, for suspension especially this is of course go this going into high end vehicles and uh, so so called adaptive suspension is in existence for a long time and there are different technologies being used this is one particular type of technology which is uh, using electric motors as a actuator and uh, added to that because of the recent developments in uh, data capturing sensor technology and also connected uh, nature of the vehicle uh, there is some uh, uh, the algorithm of this system is such that it predicts uh, how uh, the wheels are, what wheels are going to come across and takes action based on that so it has to uh, happen very quickly like sadar earlier said in three seconds and uh, it is also the vehicle it's connected with the cloud from which using the spatial spatial uh, information of that uh, map of the road condition if there is information about that that's used into it so it's very complex in that sense so I, I I hope Yeah that was helpful thank you thank you team sona thank you team The next question is from Arun Kujat yes uh, Arun your line is unmuted now please uh, go ahead Hi Arun Think we are not able to hear Arun We will go on to the next question from
Nilesh Damanska. Nilesh, your line is unmuted. Now kindly go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so see, my uh, question is pertaining to your starter motor business. Uh, so I think I was just kind of uh, referring to your previous uh, quarters PPT, in which so in which I think you mentioned that uh, the uh, the nine month uh, CYO twenty one market share uh, in starter motor is about five percent, and uh, uh, CY uh, in in the current PPT uh, current quarters PPT you're mentioning CYO twenty one the market share is four point six percent. So it implies that Q4 there's been a, uh, a sharp ma market share loss, so as to speak. So is is this the right interpretation? And if there's a market share loss, then what 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 is the reason for that? Sure. So it is the right interpretation. Uh, the reason is that the markets we have larger market share in are, for starters, especially uh, North America and Europe. So what has happened is global auto sales in this quarter dipped only two three percent year on year, while the markets we have larger market share with they performed fairly fairly uh, poorly in relation. So which is why it shrank. Uh, we haven't lost any uh, customer or any order or anything. The markets we are dominant in they didn't perform well. Got it. So it's uh, pertaining to the region-specific issues of your clients. Yeah, but this by the way, will continue to happen because uh, often the problems that are inherent in one market, they need not be in other markets, especially in the last two years. Actually, this is a phenomenon that wasn't really around that much uh, in the good old days of, you know, prior to 2019. But now, like, I think this quarter, Asia, and in particular, the China auto market sales were actually drastically different from what was happening in Europe. Europe had a very, very bad quarter. So it's usually it was every market was up one or two percent. And so you needn't draw too many conclusions from these things. But now these things are very uh, drastic. Right. And uh, just uh, one more question, if I may. So uh, I was just noticing that uh, uh, I was just seeing Tesla's uh, uh, your, the prominent US-based suppliers, uh, to, who is one of your clients, and they uh, their volume growth uh, versus say your volume growth, uh, your revenue growth from the from the Bev, okay, uh, from the Bev revenues. So um, so <clears throat> uh, generally uh, so. It, so this time around, there's uh, again some bit of divergence. Any any reason for that? In the sense, your uh, your revenues are uh, slightly slower than than the uh, underlying volumes. Look, we can't confirm or deny any customers uh, association, and we do not answer customer specific uh, questions. Yeah, maybe I'll take that offline. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. All the best. The next question is from Ajay Rangani. Ajay, your line is unmuted now. Kindly go ahead. Well, I guess he is not there, but uh, I can read out the question. Increase in input cost and supply side bottlenecks can put some pressure on bottom line and margins. Will clients accept cost pressure or some absorption will have to be factored in? We already are. <laughs> Our margins would be much higher. No, uh, no so I, I don't know. Is the question that will they get worse from your input costs? I hope not. I don't think they are, but I hope not. Uh, and yes, there is a pass-through mechanism uh, that is there for material prices, but not for everything, right? Freight costs, labor costs, these are things that uh, you have to bear. But like I said, I think uh, we've seen the worst of that. I don't think it should continue. Okay. 
Uh, there is a question from Vipul. Um, he wants to know the BCV revenue breakup in terms of DAs, traction motors, and E axles. I, we don't provide that breakup. Look, I mean, look, we love to be as transparent as possible and answer as many questions, but we can't really go into these variables. We ourselves don't do this analysis because it doesn't yield any actionable, specific, or insightful uh, inference. I mean, beyond the point, analysis also has to have some usefulness. I, it's, uh, we don't do this. I, and I won't have this ready. But yeah, most of it would be DAs. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Okay, we can see uh, some of the hands still raised. If you have forgotten to lower your hand, uh, can you please do so? Or if you still have your question, can raise the hand? Uh, we have, uh, I think, one last question from Gunjan uh, Biani. Uh, Gunjan, your line is unmuted. You can please go ahead. Sorry, it's my bad. I think I didn't lower my hand. Uh, my, all my queries are answered. Thank you. Thank you, Gunjan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Julie, there's one more question in chat. Could you please take that? Okay, there is a question from Sham. The motor business has Sham. seen sharp, sharp 33% QOQ decline. If I combine with Europe region, sharply declining QOQ, is this due to some ICE models of customers declining sharply as EV models gain traction in Europe? So first of all, hi Sham. Uh, thank you for the question. I think it will be very relevant one year later, two years later. Right now, not so much. So this is more a customer slash model level problem. And because this is a motor thing, some of our customers, unfortunately, are more hit by the chip shortage than others. For some, the supply demand mismatch is much higher. And uh, some of our models are not highest profit per unit and they have just been deprioritized. So that's the reason. The shift to IC has not yet started hitting starter motor sales overall. And 100% I can guarantee you this in automotive changes and such big trends don't happen in one quarter or the other quarter. The same starter business which was doing on average, let's say, 100 crore plus every month will not go to 50 crore, 60 crore in a month due to a powertrain electrification shift. It would happen because of a very specific customer or model. So not really, but it is a trend we are watching and it is the direction it will go. But it will be much, much more gradual uh, than this. And I think what, what happens, I think, is this is a natural reaction that we often, for these big changes, right, we often overestimate the near-term impact and underestimate the long-term impact. So electrification is real. By the time 2030 to 35, it will be almost absolute. But the, in the near term, the change will be far more gradual. And it'll keep, it is like that frog being boiled alive, uh, well, I think it will happen in degrees. This sharpness has nothing to do with uh, that, that issue. Okay, we have a next question from Vamshi. Vamshi, your line is uh, unmuted. Kindly go ahead. Yes, uh, yeah. uh, hi, sir. Uh, I have a question on Q2 investor presentation. Is it viable to ask now? Hello? Yes, what's so, the question? Sorry, I didn't get it. 
sir i have a question on q2 investor presentation is it viable to ask now sir on q2 yeah i won't i don't readily remember unfortunately that be the problem but ask i can try okay sir try just a second yeah i'm asking sir as on q uh, end of q1 the order book was 14000 crore and the orders consumed were 1600 crores but the revenue recognized is just 585 crores so where are the other revenues sir ah so the impact has to be multiplied by 40 right so this is a quarterly adjustment okay sir i tried to explain let's say we were getting 100 rupees from a program next quarter we were supposed to get and we get 80 that is a minus 20 Now this minus twenty will be multiplied by forty to take that program of that drop, right? That's that's how it is. So every quarter you have to do the math again, and this is why ramping up often gives you very good benefits because each incremental gain actually keeps translating into further gains if it is indeed ramping up. They will hit a peak. Okay. I hope I didn't confuse you with the. Yes, sir. I'm very good to tell you. Thank you, sir. Ah, Thank you, sir. So it's a Into forty divided by forty type of thing, uh, because it's a ten year order book. The it, there is a magnification. Okay, thank you so thank you so much. Yeah. The next question is from Arun Kudiyar sir. So Arun, your line is unmuted now. Kindly go ahead. Hello, I hi. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. I can hear you. uh good job by all the team during this uh, uncertain times had done a good job i just want to ask something about the uh, uh, magnetless motors the rnt uh, do we have a um, schedule for it or, or like we try for this much period and then we come up with a result or it's like uh, no dead end how is it well all oh, are We scheduled. Uh, I mean, this is not only us trying to solve it. Toyota has also been trying to solve it since 2018. A lot of people are on the same path. When you finally find the solution, that will be the deadline. But yeah, till then, it's a it's a destination, and we are on it. We may never get there. Also, is a probability. Like it is an event that could happen. Sorry, sir. I I interrupted you, Mr. Deshmukh. No, no, no. You answered. So we have a schedule. What is the schedule? No, I said. Sir, sir, you have been taken. Well, there is a schedule. A project. Every R and D project also has a schedule. We started off with a. We have a tentative schedule of eighteen months. Uh, so six months are over of that. Eight, those eighteen months. So there is still twelve months to go. but it is quite flexible it may happen before 12 months it may happen after 6 7 months it may take a few months more also is like it was said earlier in one of the earlier interactions earlier answers that every r&d project is like an experimentation and we there are different options available to you you try several things and you learn from failures and then you go ahead so in the same there are many iterations which need to be taken and uh, therefore you cannot rigidly say that it will happen in 18 months or 12 months there is some tentative plan that we have which i mentioned is about 18 months but it could be another from today it could be another 6 months or it could be another 12 or 18 months depends on or like vivek said it may not uh, result into what we are looking at because one we have to there are certain uh, targets set in terms of it, it has to be a magnetless motor but it also has to be within certain uh, boundaries such as the cost and size and weight and so many other things so to be able to achieve everything uh, is a challenge and if we do not for example ultimately we come out with a magnetless motor which is uh, much more expensive and is non competitive we may have to drop that so therefore it's very difficult to say when it will happen but 
you can take another 12 months as a tentative uh, schedule thank you very much and uh, all the best for the r&d program Any more questions, please? I don't see any raising hand right now. Hi, everyone. In case there are any questions, uh, please do raise your hand. Okay, uh, Vivek, uh, we don't have uh, any further raise hands uh, that I can see. Hopefully, we've tried to take as many as possible. Uh, I will now hand up back to you for remarks. No, that was great. And thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for making time on a evening and uh, outside work hours to listen to us. And hopefully we answered all your questions. Uh, do reach out. Uh, you need to ask more. Thank you. Uh, we, th we thank the entire management team of Sona Comsta for uh, patiently taking out so much time and answering all the investors' questions in detail. Uh, and Juliet, we can close the call now. Thank you, all the investors. Thank you. We will now conclude this call. Yeah, we will now conclude this call. If you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email your Nomura sales representative or corporate access team. Thank you, everyone, for your time. You may please drop off in the line. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Juliet. Thanks, Kapil. Bye. Thank you.